Right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this week's uh, Monday market webinar with me, Michael Hewson, in place of Jasper Lawler, who's off uh, this week on a well-deserved break. Um, I'll be looking at some of the key events this week, but before I do that, I'm going to run you through the the risk warning, uh, the disclaimer, um, which I have to show. We have to show at the beginning of every meeting, every meeting, every webinar, rather. And um, obviously, we'll dissect the events of the last, at the end of last week, and the surprise decision or the unexpected decision on some parts, on some people's part of the Federal Reserve, to keep interest rates unchanged. It was no real surprise to me that um, the Fed decided to hold off raising rates. Um, I think it's important that when you listen to all the noise about the prospects of a rate rise and the arguments for and against that you look at the Fed's mandate with respect to the U.S. economy and certainly we're already getting some fallout this week and will be getting some fallout this week on the back of um, the decision that uh, we saw at the end of last week. Um, as a recap, the Federal Reserve is widely expected or it was expected to push rates up by around about 0.25%. It was a sort of 50-50 split between the rate rise hawks and, um, and the doves, and the doves came out on top. And I think in that context, what we have to do is we have to look at the Fed's mandate in the context of what it needs to target to... Um, in its deliberations with respect to the U.S. economy. Now, I think part of the problem, I think, has been the Fed's guidance, and the Fed's guidance has been opaque at best. It has an inflation mandate, and it also has an employment mandate. So it has two pillars. It's, it's, meeting, its, it's meeting its employment target, but it is not in meeting its inflation, and its inflation target, and that's where fundamentally it's falling short. And um, if you actually look at the content of the Fed statement, which we can do, um, we can see the, real, the, key, the key paragraph in this press release is in the third paragraph. This assessment will take into account a wide range of information, including measures of labor market conditions, indicators of inflation pressures and inflation expectations, and readings on financial and international developments. So those last two components are really the two key components that dictated the Fed's decision to hold rates on Thursday. They went on to say the committee anticipates that it will be appropriate to raise the target range for the Fed funds rate when it has seen some further improvement in the labor market, which is arguably it has, and is reasonably confident that inflation will move back to its 2% objective over the medium term. The key words there being reasonably confident. Inflation is actually on the decline. In August, it posted a month-on-month -month negative print. Therefore, I think it's stretching credibility somewhat to suggest that the Fed can be reasonably confident that inflation will return to target over the course of the next year or so when it's... CPI rate is at 0.2% and the inflation target is at 2%. So I think that gives you an indication of how weak inflation is in the U.S. economy. Now, there are some who would argue, you know, the U.S. economy can probably withstand a rate rise. And on that score, you would probably be right. Unfortunately, things have moved on since 2006, which was the, one, which was the last time the Federal Reserve raised interest rates for the U.S. economy. In 2006, you could make the argument that the U.S. Federal Reserve was the central bank for the United States of America. It still is. Unfortunately, since then, it's pumped in trillions of dollars to the global economy. Those trillions of dollars have gone into emerging markets. Um, in the form of dollar loans, $9.6 trillion of loans, short-dated loans in particular, and as such, 
those loans will be very, very susceptible to a short-term rise in interest rates. And I think that more than anything is what the Fed is concerned about, the capital outflows from emerging markets, concerns about the movement in the Chinese renminbi peg, which could well ripple, cause ripple out effects, further deflationary effects into the global economy, which will put further upward pressure on the US dollar. Because as soon as you push one rate up, then the, the expectation is you're going to follow it with another one. And that, in essence, is what caught the market by surprise last week. Now the debate has moved on to October. And we've had Mr. Bullard, James Bullard, who's president of the St. Louis Fed. And he is saying that an October rate rise is certainly on the table with respect to um, a move on rates then. Well, I think that's highly unlikely because if you're not prepared to hike in September, why on earth would you raise rates in October? Nothing much is going to change between now and the end of October. Um, so he's, Mr. Pollard saying there's a chance of an October rate rise by the Fed. I would say that the chance is fairly slim. And certainly Fed funds imply that. This is Bloomberg Terminal WIRP. Fed funds rate is suggesting there's a 20% probability of a move in the Fed funds rate um, in October. And the fact of the matter is the factors cited by Janet Yellen in her speech earlier this week sorry, late last week rather, aren't likely to change that much with respect to um, the overall measures taken by Chinese authorities to improve the Chinese economy. And I think that's what you're really going to need to see, a significant improvement in the Chinese economy to prompt the Fed to act on rates. So for, mo for the moment, I think the most likely outcome is that we could see a move in December, but even a December rate rise as designated by this particular chart here is pretty much a 50-50 split. There's a 48.8% chance of a rise in December. So what does that mean for the dollar? And also, what does it mean for those Fed members who, prior to the meeting in September, suggested that the bar to raising rates was very, very high? And we've got Mr. Lockhart, the Atlanta Fed President Lockhart, talking later today and tomorrow and on Wednesday. Now, Mr. Lockhart gave the impression that he was going to vote for a rise in rates in August before the stock market turmoil out of China. In any event, he actually voted to keep rates unchanged. So I think it's worth listening to what Mr. Lockhart has to say. We know Mr. Lacker dissented. It's, very wor it's worth knowing what Mr. Lockhart has to say and what caused him to change his mind. And I think that's very, very important. What caused Mr. Lockhart to change his mind about a September rate rise? So um, his, his comments later today will be very, very important in the context of the overall debate. I think, again, it's very unlikely that we will see any move in October. And for central bankers to claim otherwise, I think, um, I think it is going to be extremely disingenuous. I think the Fed is already coming under fire for, credibility, for its credibility by holding off in September. If it then goes and acts in October, it will blow that credibility to shreds because not much can change in six weeks, certainly in the context of visibility on economic growth. So let's look at some of the key chart points with respect to not only the S&P but the Dow Jones because I think in that context what we want to see is whether or not the Fed decision that we saw um, at the end of last week will have any significant repercussions for stock markets because we saw a massive sell-off on the back of the Fed decision, which was somewhat counterintuitive because for the last five or six years, low interest rates um, usually um, point to a stock market rally further QE, easy monetary policy. The fact that the Fed didn't tighten should have given us a relief rally, and it didn't. And I think the key reason that that didn't happen was because we 
a lot of people widely expected a rate hike. And then what we got from the Fed was rather spurious reasons, if you like, as to why they didn't act. And the fact of the matter is the Fed is now having to consider global growth considerations. And that is a worry for investors. They don't have the same sort of what I would call confidence in the Federal Reserve to be able to control um, the glide path, if you like, for future growth prospects. And when key economic forecasters are completely divided in what the Fed should do, that does give you a certain amount of worry with respect to where stock markets can go over the course of the next few over the next few weeks and months. So looking, looking at the S&P here, this is a little bit of a worry. The fact that we weren't able to sustain this move up to the 2000 level at the end of last week. We've got a sharp move lower. At the moment, I think we're still within this broad range that we've been in for the past few weeks. I don't think we're going to break out of that range. I certainly don't think we're going to see a strong move higher, certainly in the context of a stronger dollar. If the dollar remains strong, then I think it's unlikely that U.S. stocks will find it um, will find it easy to rally significantly. Yes, we are finding support at slightly higher levels. The fact that we got this move here, this, this strong upper shadow here, and then we close lower, and then this strong down move does seem to suggest that investors are a little bit worried about being overly long of stocks. And I think over the course of the next few trading days, we could well start to roll over and come back towards these lows around about the 1900 level here. The oscillator does appear to reflect that as well. We've also got moving averages starting to roll over as well. To reinforce that, I think we need confirmation from other U.S. indices. So let's look at the Dow to see whether or not that reinforces the slightly negative outlook. Similar sort of chart here again, similar sort of rollover. Support at 16,310 on the Dow Jones 30, the, the U.S. 30. So keep an eye on that level there. We've got one, two, three, four daily lows around about 16,300. So I think that's going to be a very, very key support level on the downside. Keep an eye on that on the top side. Keep an eye on the 16,700 area, which coincides with Friday's highs and also the highs at the end of August. We did have a little brief move above it, but once again, we found it very, very difficult to break through that 17,000 area. Looking at the small caps index as well, gives you another decent indication. We've got resistance at the 50-day moving average on that. Slightly different. We do appear to be starting to find momentum starting to peter out and stutter out. And as such, I think that's, again, likely to keep a lid on prices. Yes, we are finding support at higher levels, and that could actually be a short-term buying opportunity, certainly in the context of this particular chart here. In the four-hour chart, where we're actually finding a little bit of support through the highs from the end, from the lows rather, from the end of from the end of August. Let's quickly draw that trend line in there to give us an indication of where the support lines come in. So again, just draw the line in like so. So we've got we've got a little bit of support coming in, but overall, looking at this four-hour chart here, very strong downward candle there. Looking at the resistance around about 1,180. Um, so, we, as I say, we could see a short squeeze higher, but overall, uh, based on the daily charts, I think it's likely that we're going to see a little bit of a, a rollover and a, and a move down towards the downside, but we'll probably see a short squeeze higher first. Looking at the Germany 30, it's been a bit of a mixed session today for European stocks, um, simply on the back of this Adidas news, which was very, very bad news for the DAX given how heavily weighted um, automakers are in the DAX index. We've seen this break lower here. We're still, I think, within the broader, broader range that we've been in over the course of the past few weeks. But ultimately, I think, unless we can actually work out um, where we are with respect to the China growth story, it's going to be very, very difficult for the DAX to make any significant upside until we get further clarity on the health of the Chinese economy. Now, in that context, um, this, this, this Wednesday's Chinese manufacturing PMI could actually be significantly 
could be significantly important because this Kaising manufacturing PMI was the number came in a 77 month low that also preempted um, the widening of the band and the easing of the band by the Chinese authorities in August. It came in around about 47.8. Since then, we've seen another easing in monetary policy by the Chinese authorities. So I think in that context, um, we need to keep an eye on that particular economic indicator for any signs of an improvement to see whether or not the Tianjin um, port explosion um, actually caused that particular manufacturing PMI to be unusually weak for the month of August and whether or not we've seen an improvement in the September numbers and whether or not the August number was just a one-off as a result of the disruption caused by that explosion. So keep, keep an eye on that. I think that could, um, that could actually prompt a little bit of an upside surprise. Um, but at the moment, the jury remains out on that. So certainly keep an eye on the DAX. Same for the FTSE 100. FTSE 100, again, finding decent area of resistance around about 6,300, but finding decent support just above the 6,000 level. We can see it through these lows through here, long shadow there. Um, looking at support over the last couple of days, again, around about uh, 6,070. But what's interesting here, ladies and gents, is this bearish engulfing day here on Thursday. We had a very negative day on Thursday uh, and then a very negative day on Friday. Now, we've partially reversed some of that today, but ultimately we're finding that around about 6,270, there's a significant area of resistance and it's hard to really get your head around as to what would cause us to significantly push above this area between 6,270 and 6,300. So looking at this, I think we're in a broad range in the FTSE 100. If we do get a rebound in oil prices or commodity prices, then we could well get a rebound in the FTSE 100. Uh, it's certainly something to keep an eye on. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't appear to be getting anything that could be considered a rebound in oil prices. But there does appear, on the face of it, and this is something that I've been looking at for quite some time, with respect to oil prices, some evidence that maybe, maybe, and I'm caveating this extremely heavily, there could be a short-term base in oil prices. If we look at this particular candle here, this candle here on the weekly charts is a potential bullish reversal. And I say potential because at the moment, since we posted that particular reversal pattern, we posted three successive weekly declines. But what's interesting about this is we actually haven't traded below the lows of the week before it, which is around about $44.80 on the Brent contract. So if we drill that down, to a daily chart and then a four hour chart, we can see from the price action, yes, we are in a bit of a downward trend, but there does appear on the face of it to be a little bit of support building up on the downside. We haven't yet had any evidence that a low is in, but I'm keeping an eye on this series, this low here around about $46 a barrel, but also um, keeping an eye on, on this area around about $44.80. So what I think we really need to see here, and the, the, the four-hour chart does appear to reflect that, that maybe we are starting to build up a little bit of a base. It's taking a while to build build itself up. Is there a base building process in place at the moment? It's difficult to say with any degree of certainty, but the fact that we haven't come back into this corridor here between 42 and $45 a barrel would appear to suggest that there's a possibility that we could be building up a bit of a base. We get a break back up here, and then we could head back to $50 a barrel. Now, when I say talking about a base, I'm not talking about a rally back to $70, $80 a barrel. I don't think we're anywhere near that. And certainly in the context of Goldman Sachs' call for $20 a barrel, I don't think we're talking about that either. 
but what I am saying is that with all the with all the analyst talk of a lower oil price, I think there is a risk that that particular trade is becoming a little bit crowded and we could actually start to squeeze higher. So certainly in that context, keep an eye on this downtrend line here. It's a similar sort of story on the WTI contract, similar sort of um, price build up. We did get a little bit of a breakout in the triangle on the four hour chart on uh, at the end, in, the, in the middle of last week, ultimately proved to be a little bit of a false break. But if we look at these series of lows through here, ladies and gentlemen, around about $43 a barrel, it's interesting to note that, again, if we look at the weekly chart, it's a similar sort of story, a very bullish candle here. It's a slightly different story with respect to the weekly closes, unlike Brent, where we saw three successive weekly declines. We've only seen one weekly decline, and we are now slightly up on the week today. But that could well change very, very quickly. While we remain above $43 a barrel, certainly on the four hourly chart, then I think there's a good chance that we could slowly start to weaken move higher back towards 49 or $50 a barrel. So certainly keep, keep an eye on them. And I think if, if oil prices do start to form a little bit of a base, then that could have benefits for the Canadian dollar. And we certainly see the Canadian dollar enjoy a certain amount, well, I hesitate to use the word enjoy. I don't think anyone enjoys um, getting whipped around on volatility, but certainly in the context of this triangle, triangle breakout that we saw on Friday, we saw a sharp move lower on this triangle breakout here. Unfortunately, we did not meet our minimum price objective at 129.53. We got close to 130 on the breakout. Now we're back inside it. And the worry is here, I think, that we could actually squeeze all the way back up to this upper line here. But overall, I, I really cannot be bullish on the US dollar at this point in time, irrespective of what you think about whether or not we get a rate hike um, whether we get a rate hike in October or December, certainly on the four-hour chart, I think there's more probability that we could start to roll back over and head back towards 131 as opposed to 133. And um, I think what we've seen here is very thin liquidity, very thin volumes causing an awful lot of what I would call market volatility. So what is the Fed's decision to hold rates mean for euro dollar. It certainly gives Mr. Draghi a bit of a problem because the last thing the euro area wants is a stronger euro. And in the past couple of weeks, we've seen the euro continue to move higher. Certainly in the context of this four-hour chart that we've got here, I've been tracking this trend line from the lows in August, which is which I've drawn on the four-hour chart. Overall, though, if we look at these highs and lows, we can see that the lows are getting higher and the highs are getting higher. Now, that's 117. We've seen a sharp move down on Friday, which seems bizarre when you consider that um, the Fed left rates on hold. But with Mr. Draghi due to speak later this week on Wednesday, um, we've heard an awful lot of chatter from ECB policymakers that the ECB are prepared to do more with respect to further QE and um, maybe outline further measures to extend their QE program beyond 2016, September 2016. I think that's unlikely. Um, I don't think everyone can keep their currency weak all at the same time. The Federal Reserve probably doesn't want a stronger dollar because it doesn't want weak inflation to ripple out through the U.S. economy and certainly weigh on the manufacturing sector. We've seen very, very weak manufacturing numbers last week from the Philadelphia Fed and the Empire Manufacturing Survey. We've had weak price pressures. We've seen weak wage growth. And the likelihood is a continued strong dollar will continue to weigh down on the U.S. economy. And it certainly means that um, U.S. data will continue Continue to be in the spotlight with respect to expectations about an October hike, which I do not think will um, happen. 
One other thing that we need to bear in mind about the U.S. economy is there's a high probability that the U.S. government will shut down again, um, the failure to raise the debt ceiling. And I have a feeling that even though it wasn't implicitly mentioned by the Federal Reserve, that could have been behind the deliberations to keep rates on hold. The fact of the matter is political instability in the U.S. economy is the last thing that uh, any economy needs. And therefore, you raise rates and then you get the government shut down. I think it's a similar sort of story to what we saw in 2013 when the, when the Fed decided to delay the taper because of the fact that we had a similar debt ceiling squabble between Republicans and Democrats. So I think, once again, um, we could well see that, that play a part in the decision to keep rates on hold. So looking at the euro dollar, look at this, keep an eye on this trend line support from the August lows currently comes in around about 112.30, 112.40. Um, below that, we've also got significant support at the 50 and 100 day moving average. These are the levels that I've highlighted in my chart forum update on spread bet. And I try and update these every single day on euro dollar, on the pound against the dollar, dollar yen and uh, cable and euro sterling rather and it's a similar sort of story on cable chart as well we can see it in this four hour chart that i've got in front of you here again we've got higher highs higher lows we've got a nice bit of support between 154.70 154.80 we've got a little bit of a peak here we could well continue to trade sideways even if we break below 154.70 80 we've got solid support around about 153.30 which was last week's lows again the chart forum there highlights those uh, those um those key levels which i've talked about in previous updates so you can get a fair idea of where the key levels are with respect to my charts and how I arrive at the levels that I talk about. With dollar yen and euro sterling, it's actually surprising how similar these charts are because again, we're in, we're in trading triangles and have been for quite some time. Support coming in just below um, 119 on dollar yen and around about 120.90 on the top side. That's the range until such times as we break out either side of those ranges. That's probably the best way to trade it. I really don't see too much in the way of top side, but again, that really depends on whether or not you think that um, the Bank of Japan is going to announce further QE. I think it's unlikely, but you never know. It's very much a QE expectations driven market. And as such, it's going to keep markets off guard and it's going to keep markets on edge. Euro sterling, again, a similar sort of story. We're right on support around about 72.45. If we do break lower, then we could well see a sharp move down to 72, the figure of 71.80. Looking at the four hour chart on Euro sterling, it's starting to look a little bit oversold. Um, so certainly I think in the context of three, these three lows here, we could find a little bit of a bounce around about this, this area currently where we are at the moment. But if we do break below this, this, this moving average here, we could see a sharp move down to around about 72. But certainly this triangle would appear to suggest that if we do break lower, we could break, we could see a sharp move down from these lows here and I'll measure that quite I'll measure this from here actually I've done that wrong let's get rid of that this is one of the useful features of the platform is you can calculate price objectives using Fibonacci so if we go from here that's gone the wrong way as per usual always does that because I've gone backwards so we'll go there and there. So if we, if if this is a classic triangle breakout, then the, we, the potential is for a move down to around about 71 um, on 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 a measured on a purely measured move basis, and we can get rid of the um, other Fibonacci projections 
just like that. So initially 7154 and then a move down to 7097. So we'll be keeping an eye on that in the short to medium term. But certainly I would be looking for a move below 7230 to confirm that that triangle has broken out before even thinking about going into that particular trade. Right, okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, it's now 12.44. Is there anything else in particular you guys would like me to cover um, before I sign off this particular webinar? I'll just quickly remind you about the key economic data announcements that are due out later this week. We've got French and German manufacturing and services PMIs for September due out on Wednesday. They could well give further indications as to whether or not the ECB will be inclined to jawbone or talk the euro lower. We've got US durable goods on a, on Thursday and they could give a good indication as to whether or not um, the US consumer is starting to um, spend a little bit more money, core durable goods, which so far this year have been negative. And given the fact that the US consumer has enjoyed a positive fiscal boost from lower oil prices, it is one of, I think, the little mysteries of this particular debate about whether or not the US economy is doing well, why US consumers aren't going out and spending money, because certainly the durable, core durable goods numbers don't give the impression that the U.S. consumer is particularly confident about spending money on big ticket data items like TVs, um, fridge freezers, and other, and other big ticket items, which would normally, um, which would normally sort of point to a significant confidence in the robustness of the U.S. recovery. So. Um, you know, you may have noticed I haven't talked about the Greece vote and the fact that um, Mr. Tsipras has been re-elected um, with a pretty much the same mandate that he got in January. To be quite honest, the Greece vote is really a story for later this year and early next year. Markets don't really care that much about it. We don't think it's going to create that much of a ripple effect over the course of the next few months. It's important in the context of whether or not Greece is able to implement uh, the reforms that uh, markets think that it will. Personally, I don't think that it will do, but it's a story for another day. It's certainly not a story for this week. Markets have more important things to worry about, like um, Chinese growth, emerging markets growth, and whether or not the Fed, or when the Fed is going to raise interest rates. So unless anyone has any other further questions, I'd like to all thank you for your time, and um, if you want to listen to this webinar back, it'll be on YouTube hopefully in the next 24 to 48 hours.